Good evening, everyone. I'm sure you're all ready to go home, so I'll try to keep this brief and start by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be here. Uh, and it's particularly nice to be with people that suffer from the same disease that I do, which is a lot for type. And uh, it's nice to share a passion. So thanks again for the opportunity. I was told by a very reliable source that the thing that really makes God, amuses God, is people who plan. Uh, but I nonetheless went ahead and did some planning for this talk. Uh, so the first thing is, we're going to stroll through time and space. A bit random, but that's the only way I think I can share my experiences with you. Next thing is, we're going to meet characters, and I'm going to delve more with people than type, because I think we've seen enough type here. And the kind of people we're going to deal with is uh, enablers, people who made it possible for us to do what we're doing today. Because without their efforts, their brains, we wouldn't have half the tools we have today that make doing what we do so easy and convenient. I'm also going to talk about machines, some of which I use, some of which kind of uh, help me understand type because I stayed into type in a very unconventional way. So I didn't have a conventional training in typography. Uh, I kind of swayed into it quite by accident. But things happened in my life that exposed me to things, situations that allowed me to kind of really get into it. And it's something that's never left me. And uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about, which is the people you may know, some of the machines I'm going to look at you may know, some you might not. So the idea is, where do we begin? And uh, you know, I thought, let's pick a fairly arbitrary date, 1872 in a country like Uruguay. And why do you think I should do that? Well, it's not that arbitrary. And you know, I might also jump back and forth, because the one thing that has kind of uh, marked everything I do is a sense of confusion and lack of order. And I think going back and forth often helps. Now, this is why it's really great. Any guesses who this is? <coughs> it's a man, I think we owe a great, great big debt to. It's Edward Johnston. Uh, without what he did for us to understand fundamentals of typography, well, letter forms really, we wouldn't have the kind of revival in, in the understanding and the production of type that happened after him. And he was tireless. He was a tireless scholar, proponent of good type, good letter forms. This is his home. It's a place of pilgrimage, which uh, most of us who love type and had an opportunity to be around in London and go and see. Uh, Herman Zaff, you know, himself a tremendous, tremendous designer and a contributor to typography, got a great tribute to uh, uh, Edward Johnston, and he says, nobody had such a lasting effect on the revival of contemporary writing as Edward Johnston. He paved the way for all lettering artists of all of the 20th century, and ultimately they owe their success to him. And we do, because people he inspired are people like Eric Gill um, and, and everyone after, because anyone who's done anything substantial with typography in, in, in that generation came uh, from everything he's done. Uh, his book was a classic, published in 1906. It kind of looked at the fundamental primitives of letter forms. He was very interested in, in sources, in history, in how we form shapes, letter forms particularly. And it had all to do with penmanship, the tools we use. And so he, he's researched in, in, in a meticulous way and uh, produced this book. His classes at the Royal College were absolute works of art, his blackboards. I mean, this is what they look like. Uh, oversubscribed, completely oversubscribed, I mean. And by the time it was finished, his blackboards would look like this, they're complete works of art. And he believed in doing, he wrote. And he was the, you know, tireless scribe, great guy. So this inspired him when he went to understand classic Roman proportion, the trade and inscriptions. Uh, he, he, he gave us some basic uh, uh, forms for how capitals were derived, rounds, three-quarter, narrow, and extra-wide, and 
all based on the Roman Trajan inscriptions. He also went on to describe character shapes, and this becomes very important for typographers, uh, fundamentals such as the weight. He described weight of type based on the thickness of the nib. So if you took a nib sideways and did three strokes, five strokes, or seven strokes, and that would determine the height of the character. Well, obviously, the one that was three strokes would be the heaviest, the one that was five, slightly lighter, and the one that was seven even lighter. Penning angle, the angle at which you hold the pen, uh, determined the shape of the letter. The form of the letter, whether condensed or expanded, the number of strokes that went into making the letter, the order of the strokes, how did you start, where do you finish, and so forth, the direction, and the speed of writing. And that he described very thoroughly. It's an example of it. So the weight, as I said, which is all right on top there. Anyway, you can see it on top, three different weights. Pen angle, uh, you can see the form of the letter, whether wide, condensed, extra condensed, and so forth. Uh, you see the strokes, mm -hmm. and then you see speed, the effect speed has. When, when something is written in a leisurely fashion, it tends to be a little more expanded. Fast letters that tend to be compressed. He also designed the, the typeface of the London Underground, which survives to this day. Uh, so in a way, he, he was a proponent of the first major corporate identity program, and that was this. Um, it, it, it will help that there were enlightened people in London Underground who kind of saw what he was trying to do and allowed him the opportunity to do it. This typeface has been revived recently, digitized. A friend of mine, I.T. Kono, was responsible for it. Uh, and it survives. It survives brilliantly to this day. The London Underground uses it. All the maps and everything is done in it. The symbol Edward Johnston did survives to this day. Uh, now we'll jump back uh, to 1864. Why 1864? Well, in 1864, in this place, that's Pune, the Brits started a school. Uh, they started it for the children of the British Army officers. Uh, it was called the Bishop's School. Its motto was thorough. They really rubbed it in. You had to be thorough about everything you did. <laughs> so this was, what, about eight years before Edward Johnson was born. Uh, I had the good fortune or the misfortune or whatever you want to call it to attend this school many years later. And the one thing they did there, probably a hang up of the way the Brits taught the children handwriting, every morning before assembly for 20 minutes he did this copious, mindless letter writing. And they were copy books, where first this copy books. And every day you sat and wrote these things. The better part of that is this question, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And, you, and I've done five years of this every morning. Uh, it's not anywhere in the tradition of the letter forms that Edward Johnston propagated. Uh, it's a whole different genre. But the doing and the redoing of this every day gives you a certain kind of rigor to look at form, to appreciate form, to understand why some things look sloppy, some things don't. And uh, at the time I did it, I probably hated it because we had to use a, a quill pen and do it every morning. Uh, but looking back, it, 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 it's probably what gave me the first bug for typography. I mean. You know, you do this over and over again every day. It's never going to lead you. You know, it's a nightmare. It's, it just stays with you. So that's what happens. Now the next thing, you know, if you're a hotel and a Gujarati, you have a genetic predisposition, which is you can't do anything other than commerce. So people like Mahan Vibhai, uh, Adasha Patel, these are heretics, you know, we're outcasts. We are, you know, we're, we're supposed to be making money, doing worthwhile things like owning shops and running businesses. So obviously when I finished school, art wasn't an option, or at least that's what everyone thought. You know? So with that in mind, I ended up studying economics. Uh, and then what do you do after economics? I guess uh, you get an MBA. So 
you know, like most people, I, I, I tried getting an MBA. I had very high aspirations for everything I did. So I thought maybe I'd give a shot to Harvard, but then they said they want three people straight out of college. So I went and worked in England for two years. I worked for a construction company that was building of roads, and I was working there as an accounts person. So I was like doing things, I, I don't know why I ever did it, but I did it. Anyway, uh, it helped me get into Harvard, which is where I ended up going, to the Harvard Business School. I joined there in 1974. Uh, and the thing about Harvard is, it gives you this uh, cocky confidence that you were right. You can virtually do anything under the sun. <laughs> because you're with people, uh, many of whom, most of whom are terribly more accomplished than you ever were or could be. And, and you think, I'm rubbing shoulders with these people. I must be great. I wasn't. But I had that false sense of bravado. Uh, the first summer, when you finish the first year, you get a job and people typically go to Wall Street and do things like that. And then among the various other things you could do was uh, pitch for concessions which were owned by Harvard universities as businesses and, and run them that summer. And I, I pitched along with a few other people uh, for a concession to publish a job search guide for MBAs. And the deal is this, uh, you publish the thing, your, your, what you earn is advertising revenue, what you have to do is give uh, the top 10 business schools in the country free copies of this, and whatever money you make is yours. But because the concession is owned by Harvard University and it has a tradition, I mean, this thing's published every year forever and ever, you walk into that piece of paper in a bank and they give you money, so you, you literally start business on day one. Your content is virtually free because every MBA that's finished that graduated from a B school writes for you on, on what it is to be a banker or, or running a chemical company. So that's all your content. You get advertising and you print it and great, you make money. Now, we all divided our responsibilities and uh, for some odd reason I said, let me try production and design. I've never done anything like this. And again, the same typical cocky business school confidence. I call up the design director of Harvard Business Review, and I said, uh, I introduced myself, and I said, uh, would it be possible for you to teach me everything you know about design in one afternoon? Because I'm in a bit of a rush. We have to publish some job search guide. And uh, it just so happens he was an extremely patient man, uh, extremely, uh, and, and these are those confluences in life, you know. You never expect that they happen. He, he was an academic. He was the dean of a design school in southeastern Massachusetts. His name was Dietmar Winkler. He was a German, a tremendous typographer. He was quite amused. He called me in, and he gently ex explained that, you know, stuff like this you don't learn in an afternoon. It takes a lifetime. Um, and anyway, so I, he, he gave me some basic training. I've got my quite training guidelines on how I go about doing something like this. And uh, I got utterly fascinated by the process. And at the end of the summer, I said, yeah, I don't, I don't want business school. I love this. I'm going to pursue this. So I went back to Deep Winkler, and I said, look, I've never studied art. I've never studied design. Would you consider taking me as a student in a school? You know, I'll do anything. So he thought about it. He said, OK, I'll take you as a special student. And that's what I did. I went in there as a special student, and I studied design. But then, coincidences. I started reading a lot about type because Dietmar Winkler kind of said, you know, the thing about typography is you need to understand the roots. So one of the books he recommended was Daniel Berkeley Updike's Printing Types. <clears throat> and as again, this is another sign from God. I read the preface and look what it says. These things were done as lectures at Harvard Business School in 1916, and I said, this is a sign. I'm doing the right thing. So, so, so I think I was set. Uh, what I didn't tell you earlier was that I borrowed money to go to business school, and it's expensive business, even when I went there. Uh, and when you take the loans, they're based on the fact that you're going to finish business school, and you're going to earn a lot of money. And so you pay it back very quickly. Now, I've, I went to design school. I wasn't going to earn anything like that. So I had this huge mountain of debt in front of me. 
but I was loving what I was doing. So I finished design school and I head out. And the thing I, I learned was, what do you do? You follow your dream. You need to be permitted, but don't take yourself too seriously. I, I, I think irreverence is a great thing to have all through your life because the minute you take yourself too seriously, it, it just falls apart. Uh, I think taking risks is very important, otherwise it's terribly dull. And um, try to get paid for having fun. I try, I get paid for having fun and I'm really enjoying it. I don't make anywhere near the money the people I went to school with at business school, but I think I'm having a lot more fun than them. Uh, so after business school, I head out to New York. That's where everyone goes, to chase their dreams in New York. Uh, I got very lucky, I got a job. But then I was also facing this huge mountain of debt. I did my math. I said, huge debt, one job, huge trouble. Huge debt, two jobs, slightly less trouble. So I said, what do I do now? So my first job was God said. I ended up working for Esquire magazine, which was just as acquired at the time by two really amazing people, a man called Milton Glazer, the brilliant designer, and a guy called Claire Felker. Together, these two had started the genre of city magazines. New York Magazine is what they'd started and made it a very, very profitable venture. There was no notion of a city magazine before that. And a wily Australian called Murdoch came from the back door and acquired it. I mean, he, he did all kinds of maneuvers. So suddenly, these two very brilliant people who started this magazine were left without a thing to do. And uh, so they bought this magazine. And I don't know, luckily I managed to get a job there. So the two guys were Milton Glaser, who's smiling out there. That's Clay Felker. The lady on the extreme right is Catherine Graham, who was the publisher of the Washington Post. And the lady in the middle is her daughter, who, who's a journalist at Washington Post. Uh, Catherine Graham's father and family, were very, they published the Post in New York, very powerful publishing background. So working for Milton Glaser was like working for God at the time. I mean, he, he was just the most amazing designer. People will remember he did that poster years ago. Uh, amazingly talented man. <clears throat> and that was a great break. This is the man who bought them out. And that's Clay Felker there, that's Rupert. Rupert Murdoch had an ability to kind of go and get into countries and look at assets, as he said, that were undervalued and um, acquire them. And uh, he did that. He did that in New York. He acquired newspapers in New York. Later on, we crossed paths again in England, where he bought the Times newspaper, The Sun, and so forth. Uh, and amassed this huge media empire. Huge. I mean, now 20th century Fox is part of it. Uh, another guy I ended up meeting in New York, because he was art director of New York Magazine after Clay Felker and all left, was this man, Roger Black. Wonderful guy, Roger, uh, larger than life character, passionate about typography, completely passionate. He could think big. So he, from him I learned uh, how to think big. He never thought anything uh, as impossible. So this was days before digital typography. Roger was commissioning custom fonts. He designed Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, he'd get people to draw revivalist types and make the most exquisite pages. It cost a fortune, but he had the ability to convince the publishers it was the way to go. And uh, he managed. Extremely generous. I mean, I was a piss you know, immigrant with two jobs, trying to pay off debts. Roger was on this fat, expense account. He loved food. He'd take me out for lunch, which was always very nice. Uh, my night job. This is a little teaser of the kind of things I did every night. This is a machine called a phototypositor. That was incredibly popular in New York because this was the heyday of display typography. You know, uh, words were sold by this display type was sold by the word, and you know, in, enormous effort went into setting it, putting it down, spacing it, and so forth. So this is what the whole gadget looks like. It's really uh, so many things, the things on the side, chemicals. Uh, there's a spool on top, which has a film master of the font. 
uh, these things on the side, the wheels, advance paper, and then you press that lever to expose a character and you can size this. But what, you know, staring into this every day for many hours, you see characters in isolation, single letters, and you really begin to appreciate form. I mean, I, I really learned to look at type through this. Because you look at individual forms, completely isolated, and then you expose that one thing, and then you advance it to do the next. And in this, you learn spacing. So I couldn't have found a better way of learning spacing. And after you did this, the whole thing was set together. And then you, you cut and paste this on a board, on a thing called mechanicals, which is what they did. And then you'd further refine the spaces if they didn't look right. You know, you'd cut it up, move it about. Uh, and the things we take for granted now, because current tables are built into fonts, you don't even think of it, you just type it. You did it. I mean, it, you really labored over every character, every word, uh, many, many times. So for, it teaches you something. It teaches you to identify fonts, because you get these sloppy looking tracings from famous art directors, you know, they don't have time because they've had a long lunch, they're completely sloshed when they send this out in the evening. <laughs> uh, and you have to make sense of it and send it back the next day. I mean, occasionally you get really excellent things. These are called comps where someone has rendered the exact trace of the type they want, precisely the size they want. So after you've finished setting it and mounting the whole thing, if you laid the tracing paper on it, you, it was exactly the way the guy wanted it. But those were few and far between. Generally, scribbles, send it out to the type house, and someone out there needs to figure out how to refine it. And so we, I did this for many years. And yeah, this job allowed me many advantages. Um, one of which was I could work there after hours and do freelance work. So the thing that cost a lot in those days, which is, you know, uh, reproducing uh, photo mechanicals. Uh, I had none of that, I had no type costs. I could do all of that myself. I had zero cost. The, the owners of this type shop were very generous that way. So it helped. So I could really supplement my income. Type costs at the ads always had these pretty women. Uh, and I'm not trying to be sexist. There were no women ever working on type positive because you had to reek. <laughs> at the end of each night, you were smelling of hypo. I mean, it was horrible. And I don't think any, I've never, in all the time I spent in these type houses, seen a lady working. They came in much later when you got uh, 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 photo typesetting and so forth. So this fonts, the fonts you got from this, a huge selection, I mean, uh, really nice display stuff. Most of them are knockoffs because I don't think there was any regard for font design and so forth. So these were all made a redrawn. See, people, uh, this business was around 46th and 45th Street in New York on the east side, and it was full of these type shops, many of them. There was one called <coughs> Photo Lettering Inc., run by the man in the middle, Ron Tala. The man sitting down there is, <coughs> is Herb Lubalin, who did Lubalin Graph and, uh, uh, you know, various other uh, avant garde. This is Aaron Burns. These three ended up forming what is now known as ITC, International Typeface Corporation. And they were extremely generous people. I mean, you know, you could walk up to them and if you didn't know what type, which particular font it was, and, and at that time, I mean, uh, and, and it was a treat being around people like this and having access to them. This is Herb Lubelin, who, uh, who was very good. I mean, he, he, he really could draw. But the other thing he tended to do was he, he could he cut up letters a lot after he had drawn them and he'd stick it, so all that kind of composition. So this was like cutting edge display stuff at the time of Blue Balance around. So early cuts of uh, Compigraphic, which was okay for continuous text, but not display stuff. Huge devices. Look at the materials you need to run it. I mean, chemicals, film, and so forth. Uh, after that, I got a, I got an opportunity to return to India <coughs> and work for India Today. Um, it is a family-owned newspaper, a magazine, really. 
and uh, it was ripe for change. And when I say ripe for change, it offered various opportunities because the people who owned it also owned Thomson Press, which was one of the country's largest offset printing presses. Uh, they had a tradition of doing a lot of fine book work. They used to export a lot of uh, book setting overseas. So they understood good typography. They were uh, serious users of monotype, monotype uh, uh, for many years. And, and so it, it, it had all the kind of right mix of technologies. And, and Arun Kuri owned it, said, you know, I could come in and tinker, which was a great opportunity. So the idea is I came there and we undertook gradually various things, uh, design changes, so we, we first went in for some typesetting changes, we upgraded to what was next, what was laser pump, a very, very good typesetter, which offered us a lot of excellent typography. So we did it in an incremental way, so I was there four years, and in the four years, uh, and, and, and the owners were also uh, not afraid of investments, because they owned this huge press, uh, they didn't mind making a substantial investments in pre-press. And he took a very bold decision to introduce India's first complete pagination system. Uh, and it's a thing called ATEX, which was like, at the time, cutting edge. Um, and I had the, again, good opportunity and good fortune to get trained on it, and now sent off to Boston to work on it for three months. Uh, and uh, it's a proprietary system thing allows collaborative work, many journalists could work on it. Uh, it wasn't busy with, so what you saw on the screen is not what you got. But they used the notion of modes, so they had buttons you could say, if you wanted to invoke bold, you press something, and on that CRT screen, crude as it is, you get something looking bold, but that in the background would actually invoke a bold font, and you had lots of coding and formatting behind this, so that by the time the journalists were doing this and the copy was ready to come off the composition, it was pretty much formatted. So it, it effectively was a system that allowed journalists to do direct input, which is a very big thing. Um, the direct input had certain tweaks behind it that allowed them to actually style it. So, you know, when they invoke some codes, the thing would be body copy, or it would be a headline, or it would be an intro. So a lot of the work that was typically done by compositors was suddenly compressed and it got done by journalists. So this whole thing started compressing the time it takes to produce a page. But it also allowed you immense precision. Uh, prior to that, every time you needed to put something in a box, where everything was cut and paste. So you pasted it down. You actually drew a box by hand and you used rotary pens to do that. And as you drew the rule, and if you slowed down at the edge, that rune would become a blob at the edge. And so you'd never get these precise boxes. And suddenly, when you have something like this, you, know, you think like, wow, you can do virtually anything. And, and tremendous precision. Everything is square. Everything relates. Um, another interesting aside, Apex at the heart of it used a PDP-11 computer. The thing in front uh, is one of the platters, one that large platter on top that you see is a Winchester drive. Uh, and that thing was 20 megabytes, and we had 80 megabytes on the system, and you had to change them around. And you know, we thought we could save the universe on this. We had so much capacity. We were in my pocket, I'm right now carrying 16 gigabytes is this one. So it just shows you how much we've advanced. Uh, this room, when it was installed at India to them, and, uh, you know, it was like you couldn't go in there with your shoes or your particular. Um, uh, and the other nice thing that happened here, when the first words I, I was asked to actually input on the system once we actually got it going was using the Latin script, of course, but Om Fi Ganesha Nama, because we did this whole big puja. You know, we had this completely sanitized room, and the ATX engineers were all there. This, Panditji comes and breaks a coconut. And they were horrified. They said, you know, we can't do this. No, no, we can and we have to. Otherwise, the system won't work. <laughs> it worked. And it works till this day. It worked great. Uh, 
the next, the first thing I did when I returned to India, uh, and this was an act of pilgrimage, I went to meet R.K. Uh, we all, anyone who loved Kite, would seek him out. R.K. was at Ulka. So I walked into him and, uh, you know, he was his usual self, bright-eyed, you know, uh, full of enthusiasm, always happy to meet anyone who shared his passion. Uh, his eyes were always big in wonderment. He, he had the enthusiasm of a child, uh, you know, the wisdom of a master, but the enthusiasm of a child. And he was lucid. He had a stutter. But when it came to talking, it was never a problem. I mean, you know, because of his passion, it, it was never a problem. You know? and, and that was great that I could see him. Uh, you know, because all my training and everything I did was very Latin and English centric. And I knew that was what I was most comfortable with. But I always harbored a love for everything regional, and I could appreciate it. But even if I couldn't do it, it was always nice to meet people who could and who actually are masters of, of the tradition and doing a lot for it. Uh, in 83, there was this fantastic conference at Stanford about oh, computer and hand and type design. And lucky, I got lucky to attend it. And it was fantastic because uh, much of the technologies we now take for granted were nascent then. They were just about happening. And this was a gathering of fairly like-minded people, uh, many technical, many, many technical, many not. I mean, there were stone carvers, there were punch cutters, and it was just the most amazing gathering of people, all discussing one thing, which is how to report what we know as letter forms into the next generation. What are the challenges? What are the technologies? And how are we going to do it? Uh, Chuck Bigelow was a man who organized this. Another tremendous lover of type, but uh, nice confluence of, of humanist training. He was a Greek college and engineering, I mean, uh, unique confluence of skills. And so he was there. He's designed Lucida and Bing Dings, among those of you who use fonts every day. Uh, he designed this. And with a, his main aim was to actually get like-minded people together to look at what do we do with the next step with type, and where are we going from here. There was Herman Zaff. There was Don Knuth. Don Knuth had then done tech, which is a peak description language. He had also worked on Metafont, which is a font description language. RK and Knuth were very close. Uh, Knuth had done a thing with, with, with Metafont where he was, uh, where, where with a basic skeleton shape, you could actually simulate, as it were, pressure and get different thicknesses. And this was something, pressure and pen angle and you could get that whole rendering. And this is something Arke was completely and utterly fascinated by and spent a lot of time with. These two were the grandmasters at this organization, at this gathering. Uh, Elman Zaff and uh, Knuth, you know, for being a brilliant, brilliant mathematician, he had an abiding interest in typography. He would go nuts if he saw a piece of mathematics that didn't look right to him. And only he could tell what looked right in math because he was so brilliant. Uh, and he was quite unhappy. So he decided one sabbatical off just to deal with a night. I'm going to go and do a good math font. And he and, and Zaf collaborated. And they did a, a typeface called Euler, uh, which to Knut's eye was, uh, was a good math font. Um, among the other people who were at the conference, John Dreyfus, he, 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 he spoke. Um, he was a keynote address. He spoke about the turning point in typography. But what's interesting is he actually hopped back on Edward Johnston. I happened to have my Edward Johnston book with me, and I got him to sign it. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it before I came here, so I couldn't have a picture of it. Um, in, in Monotype's history, there have been three typographic advisors, Stanley Morrison, yeah, and when he, he finished in 55, John Dreyfus took over, and he was there till I think 82. Uh, a man of, again, great scholarship, great refinement, wonderful man. Uh, there was Lida 
Lopez Cardozo and David Kindersley. David Kindersley was a student of Eric Gills, so here's a direct lineage, you know, from from uh, from Edward Johnston, a real scribe and and completely dedicated to letter carving, both of them. But David Kindersley also had an obsession with spacing, which comes from carving letters and understanding proportions. And he worked with a couple of mathematicians in Cambridge and did an algorithm for spacing, which seemed to produce great results, but like many of these things that never work out, it didn't. But it would have been nice because he had a whole different take on how letters should be spaced. And uh, Matthew Carter was there. He spoke on uh, the revival of tangent spons, Galliard. And uh, this was the treat for me. Arte was there, and we were roommates. And uh, there was, I'll talk about Gopal Krishna next. But the one thing I discovered about Arte is he never, never slept. Because we had free computer time in the seven days we were there. So he would be, after a day of conferences, he'd be out there hacking away all night, and he'd return at about five in the morning with reams of code, because you know everything was busy. There was no busy wig in those days. You imagine something in your head, you wrote this code, and you fed it into this mainframe, and you saw these printouts, and then you sat and edited. And, and then he'd come back with all these printouts and code, make notes, and sit with Canute the next morning. And it was amazing how much energy he had and, and how at home he was with programming. I mean, this man encompassed amazing skills. He was, he was as at home with what Knuth was doing with his scripts, you know. Uh, and Gopal Krishna Gandhi, he was about 80 then. Crisp, erect, a war, a Gandhi topi, crisp white dhoti and kurta. He ran the Gujarati type founder in Bombay. And he was at that conference. I said, this is amazing that here's a man who's in his late 80s who's attending this because he's worried about where do we go from here. And he runs a metal type founder in Bombay. But an amazing eye for typography. He had very poor eyesight. So you'd look at proofs like this, and he could tell you any type you should do. I mean, he was a great type buff. He knew all about. Uh, uh, of the, you know, Bruce Rogers and uh, just about anyone you could name, Gopal Krishna knew. And he was out there. So I said, this is quite amazing. You have two of the greatest people, I said, one steeped in commerce and passionate about Gujarati typography, and there's Arke on the other hand, you know, who, who's interested in the Indian letter form, is interested in technology. And there we were. I said, wow. Uh, so my stint in India today ended in about 80, end of 86. I got a job offer yeah, with the economists in England, and I largely think it's because they were looking for cheap immigrant labor, and I kind of fit the bill. So that's how I ended up there, not quite really. Uh, some interesting things were happening in England then. Uh, in 87, there was a huge standoff between uh, publishing houses and the unions. It's probably one of the worst union confrontations in Britain's history. Uh, the print unions, there was a thing called NGA, I think, National African Association, and so that. And this is an interesting thing, piece of news. Uh, NGA, which is National African Association, owned the rights to operate a computer keyboard in a newspaper environment. A journalist could not. So think of this. The Economist owned an ATEC system exactly like we had at India today, where every day the journalists would type, you know, they could key in. Everything they keyed in was ready to be paginated, and it could be, but no. At the end of the day, what they did had to be beamed across a leaf line to a typesetting company, which would take out printouts and retype every word. <laughs> and this was something the union said had to be done. Uh, so, it, it, so it was a big mess. It was a complete mess. I mean, uh, there's no way the British newspaper industry could have survived because the, the economics were stacked against them. On a good week, a compositor that set type earned more than the editor of The Economist for working about half the time. 
So it was highly inflated, completely wrong. They were just not allowing anything to happen. So in all this, the Economist was a good employer, so he didn't want to confront its compositors. But they had the foresight to keep it as a as an independent company, not as part of the economist itself, but as a wholly owned subsidiary that only did the typesetting for the economist. And they were banking on someone like Murdoch to take on the unions and win this battle. And when Murdoch won the battle, the rest of the industry would follow him and just bring in the technology. And it turned out Murdoch got a lot of help from Maggie Thatcher at the time because uh, Maggie Thatcher's government legislated to allow uh, some of these unions not to be recognized. And the day that happened, it, it just changed the face of the industry completely. Because the, what, the entire publishing houses, all virtually all newspapers was, were based around Fleet Street. And the unions, the cat's whiskers, so they, they didn't realize, you know, they, they figured they controlled everything. And they worked with each other. So, you know, if, if you mucked around with the guys who were decomposing, then the distribution guys won't touch your papers and so forth. So it was a whole chain that constrained what the owners could do. But what Murdoch, who's very wisely had done, he had set up an entire operation in, in complete secrecy in a place called Wapping, which is in the east end of London. And this, he had brought in an ATEX publishing system, engineers from Australia and America, they worked in a warehouse in complete secrecy. He was ready to run with and produce a paper like this. And the unions figured they had no idea it was done in such secrecy. They had no idea. And the day the, uh, the unions broke, they figured Murdoch couldn't get a paper out. And he did. He sacked 5,000 people. And the, he hired 400 who kind of left the unions and joined them. And they produced all the papers he needed. So this kind of gives you the background. And I suppose one of the ways I managed to get a job at the, at, at the Economist was they were ready to kind of ride the technological bandwagon. But um, in the graphics and the arts department, um, they had no taking background because I had kind of straddled both sides a bit. You know, I, I had the good fortune of getting into technology at the time that was happening, so I learned on the job not technological by, by training, but when you learn as you're going along, it helps. And I had that opportunity. So I, I knew a lot about the ATEX system and how its pagination is used. And, and that was really the skill they were looking for. And that's how I managed to get there. But I still couldn't do the work I had to do in England. I had to be sent off to America and work again in secrecy in, in, in an outfit in New Jersey and prepare the entire pagination project because ATEX, I mean, uh, the economists hadn't managed to get rid of the unions completely. And it's only when that happened that we could come back and implement this project. So the, part of the deal was we wanted to reap some of the benefits of desktop publishing and uh, have, have complete design and systems integration. So that was the end of the print unions that allowed it all to happen. This is the man who enabled it. Uh, with a lot of help from Maggie Thatcher. I think if it was a long yeah. standoff, I think it was almost 18 months. Uh, and it was a nasty, nasty standoff. But the government stood behind. Uh, so this is the DTP Trinity, as I call them. I think uh, Steve Jobs and, uh, and the Fakensky and, and Warnock, I think. Without the underlying work these three gentlemen did, we wouldn't have any of the advantages we have today. Um, so it's Apple, the laser writer, and PostScript. I think it's a combination of that that makes a lot of our lives extremely easy today. And another unsung hero, completely, Jim Warnay. Uh, he wrote freehand and also photographer. Uh, amazing mathematician, lovely guy. Came to England once, we had lunch, he came to the economist, he was quite happy that the economists were kind of using uh, some of his applications. Very humble man, very nice man. Uh, so that was Jim. But later on, the economist, after we had integrated everything, we moved to a typesetter called Triple I. And this was uh, part of the CRT with this cathode ray tube things. Um, and 
the great advantages it offered was it allowed you to transmit your pages to different locations all over the world. The Economist was published in many parts of the world. So once the pages were done in London, you had to beam them to Singapore, Hong Kong, America, both the coasts of America and so forth for printing. And this was one device that allowed you to do it. Uh, but proprietary. And um, we were, you know, to my eye, there was huge problems. I've, I've deliberately not shown pages because I, I want to show you the enabling technologies behind what we do. It's easy to see pages and all that, and you've seen a lot of that. But um, so they allowed you to use only the funds they, they had on, on their system. So there's this whole deal about proprietary system. I mean, uh, postcode funds were imported across every system around. Now, uh, in England, Europe, and America, Economist was printed on glazed newsprint. And in the Far East, Singapore and Hong Kong, it was printed on, on uh, not glazed newsprint, regular newsprint. And to my eye, the stuff with the ink spread you get on non glazed newsprint made the type look just a little more robust and nice. So I said, wouldn't it be nice if you could have that same look replicated wherever we're using glaze in this print. So how do we do it? And I said, well, all we need to do is like marginally thicken the type that's being used on the glaze newsprint. So imagine uh, going from, this was a look I was getting on, on my glaze newsprint. That was about the look I was getting on non-glaze, but I wanted that look. So I said, if I can beef up my type, just that fraction, and use it for output in England and elsewhere. And you know how much they said it would cost me to do that? For one font, uh, just room, $110,000. Uh, so that's high the robbery. I mean, that's what you can get away with when you have a proprietary system. Uh, but then soon, that fell apart gradually. Postscript photographer put an end to all of that. Uh, I made a case to the editor. I said, look, you know, We've got all these new technologies, we've got new output devices, we could get a font for ourselves. And it would cost, because I, you know, how, how do you pitch something like that? Because you don't know what you're going to get till you get it, and then it could be all wrong. So I said, you just have to say a comparative thing. I said, so if you get it completely wrong, then you know more than the cost of an ad. But then, you know, and it was a great idea if it would work. But then the editor of the economy is always going to be smarter than you, which he obviously is. So he says, you know what, uh, I don't buy that argument, but I'll give you 10,000 pounds to prove your thesis. And if you get that right, you can have whatever it takes to develop it. So, so I thought that was a great deal. And uh, so I found, uh, I said, okay, so what does it take to do a font, a custom font? So I said, first, it requires a set of convictions about shape and form. And I'm looking at it in a broad sense. I mean, The Economist is largely a text-driven paper, so I wanted something that was very nice on the eyes. Um, so it takes a conviction about shape and form, uh, and then a lot of effort to resolve those minute details and achieve harmony in the proportion of that shape and form. And, uh, you know, when you're designing a font, you, you think of it like proofreading shapes, because you've got to keep looking at it but without a dictionary. See, when you're proofreading type, uh, and you see a typo, and you're not sure if it's right or wrong, you look at a dictionary, and it tells you what the right spelling is. With shape, there's nothing like that. You've got to use your judgment. And uh, it's never easy, you know. So you're always hedging. So it helps if you collaborate. And I had no better collaborator in this whole exercise than a man called Essie, Gun Laugar Essie fantastic character. Uh, modern day scribe, he, he could write, he could do calligraphy better than anyone. And for him it didn't matter, he didn't need a critic. Uh, when he used to teach calligraphy, he'd often take a carrot, slice it and start writing with it. And the letters he could produce were brilliant. Uh, he lived in Shepherd's Bush in London, and outside his house was the most gorgeous dustbin 